begin. So our topic for discussion of this afternoon, uh, again, we will do a, a more a quick review of CLUP guidebook. Um, Urban Sprawl Squires Chapter 1 and 5, unfortunately, I couldn't find the time to get the copy, so I'll be using um, my own research for definitions of urban sprawl, and this is a bit more recent as of 2019. There are some 2023 sources that I'm that are available, but I'm afraid to use because it's not yet cited, but they do have a lot of references in their research. And then maybe you can also use this as uh, in your own research. Next, growth management review. Uh, I just have the notes here. Uh, I'll probably flash the notes on screen. Impact fees, transfer development rights at growth boundary, are, I couldn't really get through them. Um, hopefully some of you may have gotten through it yourselves, but uh, if you follow this process of like where to pick apart um, data or information from these articles, you should be um, on the right track for like self-study and continuing study. But we're only up to, until growth management review this afternoon. Uh, I'll try to catch up with impact fees, development rights, and growth boundary next week together with all the other um, information here. And then again, May 13, we'll be doing a QGIS review to create our sort of uh, report. And then we'll use May 13 and May 20s as our sort of uh, data gathering and map making. And then uh, our deadline will be May 27. Okay. So let me just go start at the beginning again. Okay. So key thing here to remember is that the Philippines does have a comprehensive land use uh, plan guidebook. So this is supposed to uh, gu dictate, guide, um, <laughs> Comprehensive land use planning at uh, various places or like all in all of the Philippines. If you're from abroad, you might have different sets of uh, rules or guides. But for the purposes of planning in the Philippines, this is the sort of resource for uh, planning at the local level, like a barangay city, barangay city and municipal level. So similar to what we discussed last week, so the guidebook addresses climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and the inter integration of planning for upland, coastal, ancestral domain, biodiversity areas, heritage, and urban greening. So um, there are inside, there are three volumes of the CLUP and additional two sort of not really rated, but like it's additional information. The first volume deals with the planning process. The second volume deals with sectoral and tools for situational analysis. So this is a bit away from our topic. This is, um, wait, am I not sharing my screen? Oh, physical copies. Unfortunately, I, I, even I don't know where to get the physical copies, but all these digital copies could print yourself and the data should be the same um, either way. Um, what they call this? I could ask around the faculty. Uh, it's really my. It's really more of a my me problem because I have been stuck in the academe and I just been using the. I prefer the digital copy myself, but there should be physical copies around. And then finally, volume three is the model zoning ordinance. So this is for when you have the CLUP in place, um, and then you need to do that. The CLUP has been approved. I need to do further analysis, you use volume two, and then when you apply it to become an ordinance or law, that's where you apply uh, volume three. So this too, which is a lot already. Um, CLUP volume one is already over 200 pages, so we'll just focus on this. And the key thing we want to focus on here is the planning process in the Philippines. And then uh, we go over here. So there is a 12-step planning process divided into three phases over here, if you can see where I'm with my mouse. There's a pre-planning phase, the actual planning phase, and the plan implementation and monitoring. For this subject, MU, MUD 201N, we're really focusing on the planning steps. So just take note of those 12 steps, with which, which I will show in the next slide. And then, of course, the CLUP process has uh, legal mandates, is related with national programs, and we have a few principles and approaches which we'll discuss in the next slide. The guidebooks also what here 
what you call here, you have uh, several elements, the integration of the climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. These are um, uh, acts or movements in the local government and national government, which focuses on these topics. Uh, the adoption of ridge to, re uh, ridge to reef, meaning mountain top to like coastal areas framework, meaning the whole area, the whole island is considered when making the plan. The integration of public and private land use management. So uh, the public, the government in general has different needs. So we're thinking, talking about uh, uh, streets, highways, plazas, all public spaces handled by the government and private land use. This is like the retail, uh, the live and work areas um, owned by the citizens of that um, location or municipality or barangay. And then the integration of other sectors is listed here, address the lands, biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. So this concept of bridge to reef um, was introduced, uh, I think around the same time, 2013 or early 2010s. Basically this idea of a uh, complete or um, well, for lack of a better word, comprehensive planning framework. So it starts up with the forest, the upland, lowland, coastal, and marine. So this is specifically for Cebu City. And this is important because uh, land use planning has to be site specific. You can't adopt um, plans and programs uh, from different situations abroad or whatever, and then expect them to work in the same way in the Philippines. So this is specifically for Cebu. Um, other islands might have different frameworks, different plans, because uh, geographically they are different. So you need to adapt your plans to the physical um, requirements of your uh, specific project or site. And with regards to that, the Philippine government has divided physical uh, framework plans into four levels or, or, or four hierarchies. There's a national level in yellow, the regional level in green, provincial level and sort of this darker green color and the local or municipal level. And these uh, physical framework plans, which fall under basically in charge of designing the physical aspect of the land, um, they're called CLUPs at the local and municipal level. So the idea is that at the local and municipal level, it becomes very specific and provincial, regional, national are just more general guidelines because the idea the trend these days or like uh, for the past um, 20 years is that the national government cannot sort of uh, apply very stringent or very specific rules at the local level because they cannot go there. They cannot physically be in that site. So they cannot impose such strict rules. So it's up to the local level to supply what they need because they're there. They're the ones living in that area. And then to complement the physical framework plans and CLUPs, you have the socioeconomic development plans or just called the development plans. This also follows a national, regional, provincial, and local level. So just a quick Google search. Um, for Cebu, we have, uh, I think we have the regional development plans. I'm not sure if we have the provincial and local development plans. So this is a big weakness in the Philippines. Whereas if you say, uh, where I studied in Australia, these kinds of plans would be available publicly. You can ask for physical copies from your local town hall. And I'm sure in the U.S. something similar is also happening. Um, you just need to ask your kind of, local government officials. And then the last part of this sort of uh, linkages of plans are the investment programs, basically the funding programs for the different levels of uh, physical framework plans and development plans. So, the people who need to make these plans need to be compensated as well. And this is another issue in the Philippines where uh, local government workers are understaffed and also underpaid. So we don't have a lot of uh, what they call this um, development in the planning area because nobody is funding them. They're understaffed and overworked, etc. So similar to the, <laughs> if I may say, uh, similar to the education uh, system. <laughs> But that's more uh, uh, more my problem. But anyway, so the physical planning planning process in the Philippines has 12 steps. So number one is organize. Then number two is identifying the stakeholders. So organize, meaning um, you have to get the group to create the CLUP. 
identifying stakeholders important who is affected by your comprehensive land use plan, basically everyone in the city. In different cities in Cebu province, they're composed of barangays, and each barangay, uh, sort of each city can have anywhere between like, uh, like 20 to maybe even 80 barangays. So in Cebu city, I think we're somewhere around the, I'm not even sure, <laughs> there's so many barangays in Cebu city. So this is a big problem in and in of itself because we have so many people, so many different organization, organizations to uh, organize, talk with, identify their problems. And then when you finish talking with them, you can set your vision. What does uh, the, the city of Cebu want to do for the next um, uh, 5, 10, 20 years? And then when you have this vision already, then you can analyze your current situation, like wherever you are in Cebu province, uh, Mindanao, Luzon, all those other regions. You have to analyze what's existing. So. This could be a bit interchangeable. You can see the arrows going back and forth here, where you can have your, you analyze the situation first and then set the vision. It really depends. There's a lot of it depends in these types of situations because some municipalities might have, might want to set the vision first. Some cities might want to set the, uh, might want to do analysis first, um, but both can go hand in hand. Then when uh, you have the, you have done your analyzing your situation, you have your vision, then you can set your goals and objectives. So um, specific itemized goals, for example, um, more housing, uh, more jobs, etc. And then establish the development trust and spatial strategies. So this is supposed to be the second part of our class where we have the development strategies. This include establishing growth boundaries, um, fiscal impacts, uh, development fees, ways to regulate growth. So this is a key uh, discussion, which I think we, uh, uh, I really, I think I, have, I will have time, more time next week to really go through. And this will probably take about at least two hours, maybe three hours to discuss all the different strategies. And then maybe to break apart the sort of the monotony of listening to me over and over again, we can have short quizzes in between. And this time, uh, I really endeavor to have it online. So all you have to do is click and choose the answer to sort of like refresh your memory on the topics discussed. And then finally, we have prepare the land use plan. So this is basically where our class ends or the goal of our class is to create our own proposed land use plan for our uh, local uh, areas. So as discussed last week, we could do one um, for Cebu City or you could do one for your own local community. The advantage of doing Cebu City is I have the data already here, ready to go. And then uh, if you want to do one for your own local community, like for example, Mandawa City, Lapu-Lapu City, uh, different cities around the Philippines. I'm, <laughs> I'm Cebu based, so my, my knowledge of different cities is very limited. So we'll stop here, but just for your reference, step eight will be drafting the ordinance. Conduct, and then once the ordinance is drafted, like the proposed law is drafted, you will need, we will need, or the, the Philippines will need to conduct a public hearing. Then it's reviewed and then approved again to become a, a, an actual law. Then they will implement the law. And then finally, they will monitor and evaluate the CLUP and the zoning of ordinance. So the final output is like two very big documents, the comprehensive land use plan and the zoning ordinance to give that land use plan um, sort of legal um, support or validity. So there is a law that supports the CLUP. And then over here on the left side, we have the principles for, for Philippine uh, comprehensive land use planning. Uh, the idea that the watershed is a platform for land use planning. So this covers the rich three features and uh, of the land and shall serve as a common strategic planning quote unquote, vertical platform for the formulation and preparation of all land use physical plans. Basically, any land use plan in the Philippines needs to cover the mountain air, the forest areas, all the way down to the coastal areas. Uh, depending on the different sort of locations in the Philippines, you could be all mountains, you could be all coastal. So this idea that the entirety of the land should be included in the planning process is, uh, I think, very kind of, um logical like of course obviously you have to study what you have then inclusive and expansive governance so this is more of a social social factor where this guide advocates that all three actors in governance mainly 
the government, the state, or the local authorities, civil society, the citizens, and the private sector, the businesses, the, um, uh, yeah, just the businesses <laughs> are actively involved in the enhanced CLUP process. So just thinking of those three groups, the, the government, the, uh, the citizens, and then the businesses. So they all have different goals, different objectives, and just getting even all like key spokesperson in those areas, I think it's already a very uh, difficult task. So um, we have, <laughs> the Philippines has a lot of work to do in that uh, regard. Next, uh, co-management principles. So I'm making my way down this is very slowly because these are very important principles. So I hope you take note. Co-management principles. So uh, the local government code provides that local government units shall share with the national government and responsibility in, in the management and maintenance of ecological balance within their ter territorial jurisdiction. So basically, local government is by law supposed to create these plans. But again, the reason why we don't have these plans is because local government is understaffed, underpaid, and also a bit, um, they're not expertise in land use planning or even uh, sort of organizing the community. I live in here, Barangay Talamban. I don't think I've ever seen my Barangay captain, um, mostly because I am in a sort of privileged situation where I don't have uh, the need to go to my local Barangay. But um, this is an issue in the Philippines where um, I guess the privileged, privileged sector is sort of uh, doesn't want anything to do with the, with the government. I think um, some of you may relate where uh, for those who don't work in government, it's it's the the there's a stigma in local government where you don't want to go anywhere near them. You don't want to process your papers or anything because it's such a hassle. It's slow. Even though um, there are government workers who are doing their best, and it's I think that's uh, another challenge for the Philippines. Gender responsiveness and sensitiv sensitivity, basically just including all genders. Uh, explicit uh, consideration of development and population interrelationships in the entire planning process. So it's supposed to be uh, the planning process is accessible, equitable for all. Next is the integration of barangay development plans. If there are existing barangay development plans under local government code of 1991, the LDC or local development councils and the barangay development councils are tasked to prepare barangay development plans to be submitted to the Sangguniang Barangay, or basically a organization that heads several barangays for review and approval. So that's another issue. The Sangguniang Barangay are basically a head barangay that controls several different barangays. I don't know if we have that in Cebu. Uh, maybe some of you may be even uh, more aware of this than myself. Next, in the absence of barangay municipal development plans, uh, there is a... Um, encouragement or the local government is enticed to do a top bottom approach so in this in this case the provincial land use physical framework plan if available may serve as a basis for the comprehensive land use plan so we have the regional provincial and the municipal levels so in case the clup does not exist they can look at the provincial level and if that doesn't exist then uh that's a big problem but most of the time i think if you do a quick google search uh, provincial physical framework plan should exist. Um, I couldn't do one for Cebu because I was too busy researching uh, these data here. So uh, uh, Philippines land use regulation. Uh, there's several different regulations in place. For this slide, I'll be talking about two. Uh, the Republic Act for Republic Act 7586 or the National Integrated Protected Area System Act of 1992. Basically, this act identifies the protected areas in uh, different regions in the Philippines. So in Region 7, where Cebu is, um, in green, these are protected areas. And they are um, sort of given validity with different proclamations, na national proclamations. For example, here, number one in the Cebu area, North Cebu area. So if you see where my mouse is, this is the boundary of Cebu City. And you see that green area there. Um, please confirm if you can see the mouse lang. Um, that is the Central Cebu Protected Landscape. Um, 
legitimized by proclamation number 441. So supposed to be this area, there should be no developments and nothing encroaching on them. We can see, we will see a bigger picture of this in the next slide. And then in the region seven or the central Visayas region, there's 17 protected areas. But this is in conflict with um, the need for uh, municipalities and cities and provinces to grow in the Philippine, uh, in PD 1096 or the Philippine National Building Code, uh, where they sit uh, in section 105, where they describe site requirements. I will read this uh, verbatim just for the sake of uh, uh, everyone. The land or site upon which will be constructed any building or structure or any ancillary or auxiliary facility thereto shall be sanitary, hygienic, or safe. In the case of sites or buildings intended for use as human habitation or abode, the same shall be at safe distance as determined by competent authorities from streams or bodies of water and or sources of air considered to be polluted from a volcano or volcanic site and or any other building consideration to be a potential source of fire or explosion. And then the key thing I want to point out here is there is nothing about protecting land. So in the National Building Code, basically you can build anywhere as long as, it, as it's safe. And then um, I didn't go through the Republic Act of uh, Integrated uh, National Integrated Protection Areas, but it seems like the National uh, Integrated Protection Area Systems Act, or we just call uh, NIPAS for short, N-I-P-A-S. Um, as far as I know, uh, I talked to some other faculty members, this act doesn't really identify non-buildable areas or like uh, safe zones where um, the National Building Code cannot sort of, uh, what they call this, uh, encroach upon. And I will show you a, a demonstration of this in a bit, but just a review of the Protecting Prime Agric Agricultural Lands uh, article, which we read. Um, there is no clear definition of prime agricultural lands. And as such, there is no clear boundary where we cannot build or we cannot encroach upon uh, important agricultural lands. And as we discussed last week, there are several factors to making a clear definition. And just getting this definition in place is a uh, another big task in of, in, a, in of itself. So the criteria for protecting prime agricultural lands are as follows. They need to consider agronomic factors, for example, like soil characteristics, uh, environmental factors, which include climate, water quality and availability, land degradation hazard, and drought susceptibility. Non-physical factors are also considered. This include market and industry requirements. And then finally, socioeconomic factors, which include opportunity cost evaluation. That, so that deals a bit more on the um, economic side. So what is opportunity cost? You can just do a quick Google search on that on Investopedia, and that should be more or less what opportunity cost is. Basically, uh, it talks about what are the costs of not developing land? So the goal is, it's kind of incentivizing developers to ignore or take as much land as they can because it will be, it will cost them even more money not to develop. So that's the idea of opportunity cost. And then the goal of this article was just to tell us how do we uh, protect irreplaceable uh, prime agricultural land? So we need a uh, national land use policy in the Philippines case, a national land use policy should be drafted and approved and have a uh, supported by legal documents, uh, a, which will be able to promote a uh, an urban concentration strategy. Uh, key key thing here, I'll just highlight it. Urban concentration strategy as a primary means to address issues in urban expansion, efficiency, and capacity, sort of linking with uh, what we call urban growth boundaries. So putting a limit uh, where urban growth should happen. And then as I promised before, I spent a few uh, a few hours trying to find these maps. So first, I'll just minimize this over here. We have the, um, let's see, this is the land classification map for uh, proposed CLUP for uh, Cebu City. This is from, I'll share my link here. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, 
So this was from our uh, one of the professors in Safa as well, University of San Carlos, who passed away unfortunately during the pandemic. He was able to compile a few proposals, uh, silly proposal for uh, Cebu. So this is as of I think twenty. This was written uh, June 21, 2016. So this is a pro proposed CLUP for Cebu in 2016. And if you look at it, you can see a lot of yellow. Yellow is the um, what we call like buildable land. It's called alienable and disposable land. So basically, yellow is where um, Cebu City government in 2016 proposed to have development happen. And then the key issue here is that it encroaches upon the protected or the supposed protected areas in Cebu City. So I'll turn on my layers. I'll show you the protected map for Cebu City. Uh, let me increase the capacity here. Like that. So you have um, in blue, this is the uh, KML watershed. And then in orange, that's the Cebu City, uh, Cebu City, Cebu Watershed Reservation. And then green is the Cebu, Central Cebu National Park. And then in yellow is Sudlon National Park. So basically, these different colors are uh, different protected areas in Cebu City, which also have different functions. I'll just turn off my uh, highlights. So there's one, two, three, four protected land areas in Cebu. Uh, for those in Cebu City, the Buhisan uh, area is known for having uh, the Buhisan Dam, basically a source of clean water for Cebu City. And then in blue is the KML or the, um, there should be an abbreviation here somewhere. Um, let's just say KM KML, we can do a quick Google search of that. Anyway, I wanted to show you where the protected land areas here are sort of encroached upon by the uh, proposed CLUP. So if I lower the opacity of that, and then I'll highlight the boundaries here like that. So in red is where the proposed CLUP would encroach upon protected land. And then also, uh, it also encroaches down here a bit near this area is called Pamut, Barangay Pamut. Uh, meanwhile, Buhisandan is protected because I think everyone in Cebu City knows how important uh, the Buhisan Dam is. Even me as a sort of a novice at urban planning uh, is aware that that is where our source of drinking water is coming from. But unfortunately, the forest areas of Cebu are um, in danger of being built or encroached upon. And just to compare, I have a Google Maps lay over here, or like uh, overlay. And then let me just turn off. Let's see, it's getting a bit busy. I'll turn off this map here. And I'll put a background color. So fortunately, though, in Cebu City, we haven't reached that point where we're building into our forest areas. You can see Cebu City is here. This is from Google Maps. And you can see no built up areas, no roads yet going into our protected forest areas. But it's a key conflict in urban planning and land use in the Philippines, where cities really want to grow, expand. But there's a limit to where we can grow and expand. and then. Even if we built up all of Cebu City's boundary, there are also negative impacts of cutting down our forests. That means we don't have uh, uh, watersheds anymore. The function of watersheds is to absorb rainwater. Uh, that will mean increased flooding if there are lesser watersheds. And of course, um, lesser sources of drinking water. So it's hazardous for cities to just expand, let's go, excuse me, blindly into all the on um, all the buildable areas, which um, currently in the Philippines, there is no sort of national land use policy which prevents that. And specifically for Cebu City, there is no uh, accepted urban growth boundary yet. So just going over here. So that basically leads us to our next topic, which is urban sprawl. 
Now, this one is the tricky, uh, tricky definition because even up until now, a clear definition of urban sprawl hasn't been agreed upon by urban design and urban planning experts. But for the most part, you can describe urban sprawl as rapid expansion of uh, geographic extent of cities and towns. So it, there's a time element here. It grows in a very short amount of time and is usually, usually but not all of the time, uh, characterized by low density residential housing, which is supported in the Philippines by the National Building Code, where we have uh, R1, R2, I think R1 is the low density, and to some extent R2 zoning is also supported by law. Uh, basically, we have laws in place that encourage low density residential housing, and then there's no limit to where they can be built. Single zoning is also being used in the Philippines, and then finally, uh, last characteristic of urban sprawl is the reliance on private automobile for transportation. So if you have these three or these four characteristics in the development, most likely that is urban sprawl. However, a clear definition is really needed for a master of class. Therefore, I spent a few hours, a couple hours, maybe, um, unfortunately, I was very busy. I was able to find some credible, credible references here. So. Uh, you can use Science Direct. I think as a USC student, if you enter your USC email, you can have access to full articles. This is an article about urban sprawl in China, but the introduction talks about the definition of urban sprawl. This was published in 2019, so it's uh, fairly recent. So I'll just increase my area here. So because I didn't have time to summarize this into a slide, I'll just uh, unfortunately I have to read to you guys. <laughs> So uh, please bear with me. So as, as uh, written here, the definition of urban sprawl is debatable. And just to check that first statement, I also checked another um, publication published uh, July 2023. And then if we go here to their uh, definition of urban sprawl, uh, funnily enough, this is also an, an article written by China. Um, they also say that urban sprawl is still being debated in the academic community. And they have one, two, three, four, five sort of uh, references that say the same thing. And then if you look at their definition, this is from the 2023 article. Uh, I'll share this as well to our canvas, but we can check our definition of urban sprawl here. So urban sprawl uh, is uh, pre even says here pre previously, so like 1990s, 2000s, even the 2010s, Ur urban sprawl is conceived as an undesir is, uh, undesirable land use patterns with specific morphological characteristics. Uh, for example, scattered development, single use, low density development, so basically all of the, that I mentioned before, faster land consumption above population growth, and finally, an unsystematic expansion of urban areas growing into the agricultural areas. There's still more updated definitions, but if you look at the key example or the key sort of factors here, scattered development, single use, low density, faster consumption above population growth, meaning population growth, it, the, the use of land is at a higher rate than the actual population growth, which is described uh, in, the, in the previous article, which I will go through. And then finally, unsystematic expansion of urban areas growing into agricultural areas. So we can also see that here in the Philippines. Uh, although we haven't reached that point yet, uh, this is basically the protected areas in red. So, But we don't want to wait until Cebu City develops up there anyway. There's also other uh, municipalities, like if you see here, Balamban, that's on the western side of the Cebu province. Uh, it's not growing as fast as Cebu, but um, protecting our natural resources, specifically for the Philippines, is an important, um, uh, what they call this, endeavor, because we need uh, our natural resources. The Philippines doesn't have much going for it otherwise. We are technology behind education, I think a bit behind as well. That's why education is cheap. Um, so all we have are our natural resources, and we, if we use them up, if we use them up in an unwise manner, we might just uh, continue to be a third world country. And the goal is of every country is to to alleviate or like uh, develop uh, properly. So going back to uh, our reading here um, by Li Guangdong and Li Feng, they're both Li's. 
on urban sprawl. So urban sprawl is also characterized, uh, let's hear, sorry, I went a bit further. Uh, there, uh, in, according to this article, uh, of course, it's cited. If you see the citations at 87 citations, meaning 87 researchers have used this publication. So just to really hammer in that this is uh, academically and internationally agreed upon, uh, general consensus is that urban sprawl refers to development of low urban density characterized by uneven patterns of growth between an urban area and an urban population leading to inefficient land use utilization. So again, uh, uneven pattern of growth between urban area and urban population. Such that urban sprawl is also characterized by the rate of urban uh, of growth in urban areas surpassing that of the urban population, which is now widely used to describe urban sprawl process. The urban sprawl process. So remember in our syllabus, we need to describe how and why urban sprawl occurs. That's why I chose this article. Okay, and we have several sources here. One, two, three sources, Frankel, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's also interesting that none of the resources from um, our, uh, uh, basically my mentor, Neil Manharis, isn't also on here. Maybe it's because a bit too old or it's just a different way of thinking. Anyway, uh, urban sprawl is associated with a series of ecological, economic, and social issues. For example, loss of, uh, of urban open space, loss of prime farmland, reduction of forest carbon stocks, traffic congestion, uh, dislocation between home and work, loss of biodiversity and growth of energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. So connecting that to climate change, which is also in the next description, uh, local climate changes, fragmentation of landscape, and reduce air quality and, and increase water contamination. I think for the most part, the Philippines and Cebu City in particular, um, I don't think we have reduced air quality yet, but there is increased water contamination. Um, we just recently had a water conference a month ago, and the uh, key issue in Cebu City is uh, salt water contaminating our drinking drinking water in our deep wells. So uh, this is all; these are all effects of urban sprawl. So how how does it or what is causing urban sprawl? Which uh, it's described very simply here in the next uh, paragraph. So this article was really a godsend. Anyway. Urban sprawl is most commonly caused by urbanization, population growth, and economic development. So, uh, which has sort of enticed or encouraged a development pattern that has attracted worldwide concern uh, over the last few decades. So, uh, globally, the rate of growth of urban populations and urban land use has averaged 1.6% and 3.66% per year respectively. So meaning, uh, I'll just uh, write it down here on a board. I'll just uh, use this. Uh, okay, I think I'll use this slide over here. Uh, in between that, okay. Oh, wrong, I'm on the wrong PowerPoint. Okay, so urban uh, globally, we just get that. So I may or may not ask this. <laughs> later uh, in a few minutes. And I also include the resource here. Unfortunately, there's only one resource, but I think it's good enough. So the idea is that, with how big 20. So uh, urban population is only growing at 1.6% while urban land use is growing at 3.6%, almost three times more. So this is in a global sample of 120 cities between 1990 and 2000. So the researcher is Engel et al. So that's several people. So in, this, in Cebu, I think we can see that just very quickly. Uh, sorry, I keep going out of my slides. Uh, I'll just skip that one for now, where we have, I have a population growth here. Ah, here. Sorry, I misarranged my slides. From 1970s to, uh, let's see, uh, up to 2020, urban growth has been, wait, I need the percentages, steadily increasing. So I'll just show here. So this is philatlas.com, not a, uh, what I would call a kind of, it's a free to use 
um, statistics website for the Philippines, but it's not a academically correct re reference. It's kind of like Wikipedia. You don't use Wikipedia for academic resources. But just to show you the population growth rates, you see here Cebu, Cebu City from 1990s was at 2.2% growth rate. If you, if you go up even further, it kind of slows down to 1.5 in 1995, 1.77, 1 1.4 uh, in 2007, and it spikes again in 2010 at 2.95. So just to validate this number, um, where uh, urban population is kind of close, 1.6, uh, let's just say average 2%, and then uh, land use is at 4%. Fortunately, fortunately, though, in Cebu City, we don't, I don't think we have that much land use consumption or like land use yet. Because if you look at Cebu City, we still have a lot of, um, um, what do you call this? Undeveloped areas or um, unused areas, basically farmland, agricultural land, etc. And then just to give you a more visual representation of what that looks like, this on the upper left, we have Cebu City in 1984. Then if you go to the right, that's 1994, another 10 years. You can see the growth development there. It's kind of following the sort of a Talamban Road, going up into the northeast area in 2004. It develops again. And then 2014, uh, it looks like this. And then finally, 2020, I'll just increase the layer here. 2020, it looks like this, more or less. So you can see the entire southern area of Cebu City has been built up. And it's a worrying trend if you're an urban planner, urban designer, because all that happened in 30 years, or more, wait, uh, give or take. So that's 10, 10, 10, 10, oh, 40, 40 years. So if we want a sustainable future for Cebu City, we really need to limit our growth um today because we don't want overdevelopment to occur i think the only thing stopping cebu city is uh is its uh, geography where um these areas here in green there are high sloped or mountainous areas it's difficult for uh construction uh architects and builders to build on sloping land because the soil needs to be um of a certain slope too high and the building literally just falls off. But the construction here on the northeastern side is also worrying because they're finding ways to build on even steeper land. So this is uh, uh, not what we want to happen. And then uh, let me just continue over here. Uh, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Okay. The European Environment Agency or the EAA reported that European cities have extended on average by 78%, where they, where, whereas their populations have only grown 33%. So it's almost, there's a gap there. Why are they building more and more? Well, their population growth rates only 30% and they're building 70%. And there are several social economic factors for this. I think the most obvious one is that developers want to develop because they can sell more land make more money and uh, really the main reason for this is economic growth the level uh, the level of urban sprawl in european cities in and also uh, 32 countries as measured by the weighted urban proliferation or w w u p had all obviously increased with a growth rate of 1.7 percent per year between 2006 and 2009 in the United States, urbanized areas of 281 metropolitan areas have increased by 47% between 1982 and 1997, whereas the corresponding populations only grew by 17%. Uh, so there's almost a more than doubling of land use, but population is really low. So population is increasing, but not at the same rate as land use. Uh, this is mostly true for European and American countries. I think for Cebu in the Philippines, uh, luckily we're not at that stage yet, but we are seeing the sort of the beginnings of those signs. So basically, I, the only thing I want you to focus are the first two paragraphs here. There's like a few more here on China, but I think it's already 153 and we need to discuss the other topics uh, over here. So uh, one of the 
other issues or like causes for urban sprawl is what we call urban blight, where um, cities tend to grow outwards. You can see this in, Cib in Cebu, uh, where you start off with a uh, neighborhood core or a kind of central business district, and it becomes outdated and um, Cities tend to develop further inland or further away from the urban core, which causes uh, populations to shift to suburbs. So the first step is here. And then that reduces the tax base for that um, um, barangay or local community, which causes services to be cut or deteriorate. And when services are cut, businesses leave. Um, uh, first, first of all, fewer customers means businesses leave. And then the decline in the neighborhood happens. So I'll just show you very quickly what the urban core of Cebu looks like. So if you go go Cebu City, our previous urban core or like uh, central business district was here. The historic area of Cebu near Magellan's Cross, Fort San Pedro, uh, basically known as the Colon area. And if you've been to Cebu, you can tell that this area is not really um, in good uh what do you call this uh consider not really having a good status you have a lot of buildings that look like this some um not clogged drains um uh, i guess everywhere in cebu you have these like expo uh untidy electrical lines and generally these uh, urban areas are deteriorating they're dirtier they're home they're not really homes to anyone not even the um uh, Poor communities, they don't live in this area, they live uh, further out. So if I turn on satellite here, they live in the periphery. So you see a community over here. So let's say this is the old central business district of Cebu. And then you have the people who live in um, or who work in these areas usually live out here in the next uh, barangay over. Uh, because this central business district, there's nothing for them. There's uh, very few um, sources for food. There's the carbon market here, but it's mainly occupied, this central business district, mainly occupied by old buildings, government buildings, uh, basically places that are for work and not for habitation. So it's the people are forced to live further out, and you will see it here in this slide. I need to wrap up if it's almost 2 o'clock. Okay, so this is just basically showing you the growth rate of Cebu. Oh, I forgot I had a slide for this. So 3.55 in, in the 1970s and slowly tapering down to around 1.5 from 1990 to the 2000s and then picking up in 2010 and then coming down again in 2015. But never, never going beyond 4%, 5%, something like that. Okay. And um, one other issue with urban sprawl is that increased development causes increased CO2 emission and that uh, contributes to climate change. So these are just a few statistics. Uh, I won't be talking so much about this for the exam, but uh, just wanted to highlight that. Main sources of greenhouse gas emissions, this is from the um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change 2015. Number one is agriculture, forestry, and land use. Oh, sorry, that's uh, number one is sorry, electricity and heat, uh, use of energy, that's 25%. Then followed by agriculture, forestry, and land use at 23%. And then next one is 16% industry, then 14% transportation, buildings at 10%, waste at 3%, then others. So um, talking about growth management uh, a few weeks ago, so whenever you have a new subdivision, a new sort of office, residential area, they need to be powered by electricity. So it's kind of where, it's kind of obvious that um, if we control growth, we'll be reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and thereby mitigating the negative impacts of climate change. But unfortunately in the Philippine perspective, um, even if the Philippines goes completely green, the main sort of uh, perpetrators uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, number one uh, is China at 29.1%, and then followed by the United States at 15.1%, and then the United, uh, the Europe, basically 10.5%. So the bigger countries, the development, con the developed countries are the ones contributing to, are the major contributors to climate change. 
So uh, green initiatives in the Philippines are kind of using this as a, or those who are against sustainability in the Philippines use this as a reason to not go green, not uh, not apply any sustainable uh, building practices because um, it's kind of uh, just there. And uh, even if the Philippines goes completely green, we still have to deal with China's pollution, the, the U.S.'s pollution, Europe's pollution. Okay, just wanted to point that point that out there. And anyway, this slide shows that uh, Cebu City is in, in, uh, experiencing uh, continuous population growth, increase in regular income. This is for the entire city. Uh, currently now at almost 4.5 billion uh, annual income. Uh, age group, most of the population in Cebu City is around the uh, young population. So that's 10 to 14 and also the working population 20 to 24 and 30 to 34. So that's the professional population. And then it dips down from the, basically what we call uh, the experts age. So we don't have a lot of experts. We are mostly young here in Cebu City. And then the senior age, uh, everyone above 60. So this shows that um, Cebu City is a very young uh, city, uh, which, uh, and also not very good healthcare because we have very few senior population. Anyway. Uh, moving on to this concept of growth, uh, urban growth areas. As of, I think this is 20, 2020 or 2019, Cebu City has a proposed um, CLUP in the works. It's still being done even, even until today, but you can see the growth boundary is clearly drawn here with the red line. Uh, connecting it with the growth boundary identified by um, several studies before like 2015. This is a slope map of Cebu. Another professor, um, not affiliate, I think not from USC, but a Cebu City uh, urban designer and planner, uh, I think environmental planner, I think it's Ramon Sevilla is his name, um, showed, showcased this map where they, basically the growth boundary is defined by the slope of Cebu. In red are the slopes that are too dangerous to build. And it makes sense that the boundary is there. But um, for the Cebu City proposed map, uh, you can see the growth boundary kind of goes even a bit further uh, deeper, uh, further north to include what they call the uh, peri-urban areas. And in darker green, this is the protected area, the CCPL, the Central Cebu Protected Landscape. In light green, we have the very urban area, which could probably still be um, developed for like agricultural uses. And then you have the uptown area uh, in purple. This is where we have our schools, um, some hospitals, the midtown area where we have our um, offices. And between the uptown and midtown area this is where our um, residential areas will, are supposed to go. And then in yellow down here to the south will be the downtown and heritage core with a new CBD located in the um, South Road properties. This is near SMC site. Okay, and then sort of connecting this to Kelly chapter three and chapter four. I'll just bring up my notes here. They're just about managing community expansion, defining areas where cities are not supposed to grow. So they propose this idea of growth boundaries. So, um, Growth boundaries and similar methods have been found uh, to uh, determine the location of future development, establish uh, strong guidelines for development processes, providing a framework for zoning and, uh, and other regulatory factors, as well as for private development decisions. And then here we have some key descriptions of uh, growth boundaries. So growth boundaries should be built on and logically linked with existing planning policies, Growth boundaries should be based on realistic projections of population growth. So you need the like, proper uh, statisticians and um, demographic experts. Cal uh, growth boundaries should calculate, um, should use calculations of future land use requirements, should consider not only amounts of densities of various land uses, but also conditions of land ownership, site development, and geographic constraints. Uh, boundary proposals should include procedures for periodic review and adjustments of those uh, boundaries. And then uh, it will be easy for, or like it's the easiest for local communities to uh, 
create these growth boundaries because they live in that area and they can sort of enforce control. So local powers, at least uh, from the U.S. perspective, uh, I think we have also similar powers or um, tools that can enforce our growth boundaries here in the Philippines that local powers to control growth in developing areas outside existing jurisdictional boundaries are essential to managing community development. So we can have, um, I'm just re looking at my slide here, uh, regional agencies or uh, lar large counties or local government units um, can create uh, what we call ordinances, um, basically laws to enforce those local growth boundaries. And in the Philippines, the people in charge of such uh, su uh, su examples of such agencies are the HLURB, the DENR, and the I think the DA, that's Department of Agriculture, the HLURB is, I keep forgetting the proper acronym of HLURB. That's the Housing and Land Use Regulatory Board. And then the DNR, which is the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. These are the two big ones. So HLURB is housing. Uh, basically creating the uh, living areas and DNR is focused on protecting the natural resources. These are usually the two agencies that have a lot of conflict, uh, conf conflicting um, policies because DNR, DNR wants to protect as much land as possible. HLURB wants to develop as much land possible. So there needs to be communication between the two to find out where is the limit. And hopefully that can be figured out uh, probably within the next two to five years. At least in the short term, there should be a plan in the works. Okay, it's already 2.05. I'll just, um, I hope you have your papers ready. I'll just create here a quick quiz for you guys to answer. Okay. So maybe we'll just do this. Maybe just quick essay along the question. Mm, I think it's a bit hard to check, but let me just turn off my uh, screen share for a second. Let me just get some quick uh, identification questions and some. Uh, let's just do this identification. Uh, and then essay, let's quick essay. Just to check the one, two. And one essay question. Let's see. Okay. And some easy questions next. Let's see. Okay. Name two. One, two, three, four. I'm making that quiz, sorry. Uh, uh, one, this.
So just get uh, any piece of paper ready. Um, maybe one fourth yellow paper is like the size, or just like a bond paper will do. Uh, and then let's see. Mm -hmm. And then a few hard questions here. Okay, and then uh, the essay question. I'll just share my screen now. Uh, think about the essay, the essay question. Uh, sharing screen for the just 10 items. But could you upload this PowerPoint recording? Yes, I've been very slow with the PowerPoints, but this one is very important, so I'll get to it uh, as soon as the video finishes edit, like uh, processing. OK. So just quick quiz, um, 10 questions. So number one, uh, how many steps are there in the CLUP process? You can just write it down there on your notes, on your paper. What is the first step in the CLUP process? And then four and five, uh, basically name uh, two approaches to the CLUP process. So basically number four, you write one approach, number five, you write another approach. And then six, seven, and eight, Describe urban sprawl, or what are the common characteristics of urban sprawl? We mentioned that earlier in the video. And then one law uh, related to dictating urban growth in the Philippines. I mentioned two earlier. This is a bit difficult because I went by them a bit fast. But uh, you should be able to remember uh, even just the close name, not the exact name. And proposed solution for uh, what is the proposed solution according to our class outline for managing growth in urban areas? I see some questions. Yes? Sir, I think number three, I need to... Sorry? The number three question. Oh, wait. Did I miss a question? Sorry. Oh, yeah. I missed a question. <laughs> One, two, three, four. I missed a question. Let's see. Um, oops. I guess we'll just put there... Uh, so at the very least, everyone who finishes this class will be familiar with the CLUP process and urban sprawl. And then hopefully next week, we can talk about the solutions to growth management. And uh, we'll have short quizzes in between. We'll probably just do it this way again. So at least, again, train. <laughs> You can be familiarized with the concepts. So well, again, number one is how many steps are there in the CLUP process? Number two is what are what is step one in the CLUP process? Number three is what is step seven of the CLUP process? Four and five are two approaches. I think there were six approach and principles to the CLUP process. And then six to seven, three descriptions of urban sprawl. I think I gave you five. And then uh, one law dictating urban growth in the Philippines, I gave you two, so just pick one. And then what is the proposed solution according to our syllabus for managing growth areas? Basically the last thing we talked about. And then for the essay, uh, let's see. Mm, what could the essay be? Maybe I'll give this a more open-ended question. Mm. 
and then I'll just focus on urban sprawl because it's our main main the main issue why we need growth management. Uh, Okay. So I'll give you maybe another five minutes for this, or maybe maybe ten minutes. The essay is um, the essay question is. Is your city or local community experiencing urban sprawl? Are the causes and impacts to urban sprawl similar to what we have discussed? Just to verify if this thing is actually real, or maybe it's just, is it just a made up thing by academics? <laughs> so yeah, it's a more open-ended question. I'll give you, you don't have to write a very long essay. We can, uh, so we have time to check answers. Maybe another, Two minutes. So by two seventeen, we'll check our answers. I'll uh, turn off my camera here. Also, stop the recording because if it goes on for too long, it might. 